a more accurate, being as they aren't made of iron, but far lesser known name for these spheres is Favor Spheres, after the half-elven smith Emdrin Favor, who made many of these spheres and is thought to be their only creator. Welcome back, folks. I am here with Ed Greenwood, the original creator of the Forgotten Realms. And Ed, when you passed me this file to the script that we're about to dive into, it was entitled, Those Mysterious Floating Balls. Hovering. Hovering. Hovering Balls, thank you. Can yes. you please explain what the heck that means to the sure. audience? Sure, sure. Okay, <laughs> this is not a medical condition. Let's just get that out of the way at the beginning. The Those Mysterious Hovering Balls. There are, um, and... This is where it gets complicated because their other name, their, their colloquial name in the realms is Iron Spheres, mm. even though they have no iron in them. So this is why it gets confusing. <laughs> there are uh, round sort of grapefruit sized balls of some unknown, dark, hard, probably metallic substance that are encountered floating in midair in the realms and, and in other places too. We'll get into what they are, why they're there, and what they can do to you. <laughs> All right, so if you're enjoying this video, please be sure to like, subscribe, turn on notifications so you can know when the next one comes out, and uh, please consider becoming a protector of the realms. If you head on over to patreon.com slash edgreenwood, uh, the support from that Patreon is actually what allows us to continue making these videos, and you can find tons of exclusive realms lore, discord roles, works in progress, and other really great stuff. So, uh, yeah, please sit back, relax, and enjoy this very confusing realm's lore story. <laughs> and it's all my fault. I made it up. <laughs> Those mysterious hovering balls. For years, adventurers in the Home Realms campaign have been encountering grapefruit-sized or smaller, dark brown, rust-hued, or black spheres, some stashed in flower pots or trays of household handy items, others hidden in treasure coffers, under floorboards and behind bedheads, but a few floating silently and somehow menacingly in midair, in bedchambers and hidden refuge rooms and even in crypts. And for years, many finders have been wondering what these spheres are and how they got there. Sensible caution, looks like a bomb to me, have led them to often just leave the little balls alone, but a recent spate of questions from dungeon masters who happened upon the manuscripts of long-ago adventures I ran for TSR designers and editors, and for, uh, for a few four charity games at Milwaukee era Gen Cons, has led me to share a little lore with you now about these little features which turn out to be very useful in a world crawling with magic. Anyone who's dared to examine one of these spheres will notice that they have what seems to be a name or nonsense word engraved on them in Thoras, the familiar script of the common tongue. Seemingly a different word for every sphere, as no one has ever found two spheres that share the same engraving. The spheres seem to be solid and made of some sort of unique or unknown metal that's not ferrous and is rather heavy but lighter than lead and likely an alloy. And that's it. Despite these specifics, these items have come to be known as iron spheres and the few brief mentions of them in the various tomes and chapbooks written by sages suggest that they've been around for a while and were most often encountered along the Sword Coast and the Heartland's trade routes. I happen to be acquainted with some experts in realms lore who can tell me more, so I leaned on one of them, a certain old mage who has a weakness for pina coladas, tequila sunrises, and pralines and cream ice cream, among other things, to bring you more about these little doodads. It turns out that if you're in direct skin contact with a sphere, holding it in your hand, for example, when you speak aloud that word graven on it, you're making yourself the attuned bearer of that sphere by being in possession of it while uttering its activation word. It's not what wizards and sages call a command word, meaning you never have to speak it again to use that sphere unless someone else has made themselves the bearer since, and you need to reestablish your status. So you're the bearer of a so-called 
iron sphere. So now what? If you put them somewhere and don't carry them about with you, they'll sit quietly and do nothing except intercept spells cast at them or to include them in any part of a spell's area of effect. That's also what they do when you're carrying them. Intercept any spells, including area of effect spells, sent at the bearer or cast so as to include the bearer in their area. These magics are entirely sucked into the sphere and absorbed harmlessly, serving to recharge or power the sphere. When a sphere is exhausted or overloaded, its absorption capacity exceeded, it sinks down to the ground or floor, but until then, blocks all spells. It will entirely absorb wh whichever magic takes it over its limit, by the way. The frustrating thing about these spheres is that there seems to be no known way of knowing what their capacity is. As a long ago Kalashite mage said, they work, until they don't. If more than one sphere is in range of an incoming magic, one sphere will absorb it and the others not function until needed, but neither sages nor wizards know how one sphere is chosen for this role, but not the others. They also function in this manner when a bearer releases them. Unless handed to someone else or confined by being placed in a container or a room that's then separated from their bearer by a closed door, an iron sphere silently orbits the bearer's torso, closer to them than the full stretch of their arms, but otherwise drifting nearer or farther to avoid obstacles like door frames and walls. A current bearer can will a sphere to return to them and also to turn off so that incoming spells can affect them and turn on again. But if they don't deliberately do so, the sphere or spheres remain active, even if the bearer is slain or rendered unconscious. A being touching an active sphere and uttering its activation word takes over control of that sphere, becoming its new bearer. A more accurate, being as they aren't made of iron, but far lesser known name for these spheres is Thaver Spheres, after the half-elven smith Emdrin Thaver who made many of these spheres and is thought to be their only creator. Thaver was a handsome, slender, short workaholic who dwelt in Tashluta in the 1330s DR, but relocated to an isolated steading and forge somewhere in the Dun Hills when the spreading fame of his creations led to frequent theft of spheres and kidnapping of Thaver attempts by agents of various petty local rulers and crime lords seeking a counter to arcane magic. Thaver disappeared in the first few days of the spell plague and is thought to have perished, and the secret of devising these spheres has likely died with him. His human wife, Sarela, worked with him but vanished when he did and may well have lost her life at the same time. Royal magician and court wizard Court of Cormier wizard, uh, Vangradahast, is known to have possessed a handful of Thaver spheres, as did Elminster, an unidentified noble family of Waterdeep, and the watchful order of magists and protectors in that city. One sphere was for a time stored carefully in the Leaves of Learning Temple of Ogma in High Moon, Deepingdale, but vanished in the 1440s DR, likely stolen. Another was reported as being used in a street skirmish in the city of Shirtalar in 1452 DR. Two rival wealthy Sembian self-styled nobles and collectors each had a Thaver sphere, or objects of the right size and appearance that they claimed were magic foiling iron spheres, on display in their collections. In 1497 DR, these two men of Selgaunt Ithkrin Huntil and Rorolabus Narvrail are vying with each other to assemble the greatest collection of mysterious and wonderful magics that will someday save us all, in the words of Narvrail, and they've certainly assembled impressive thief magnets. Their traps have slain scores of would-be pilferers and still do to this day. Elminster knows the whereabouts of at least a dozen more Thaver spheres that he declines to share, but did offer this. 
that a merchant of Athcatla, one Nerver Hollistrant, has two handfuls, unquote, of the spheres and might well be willing to sell or trade some if approached in the right manner. Hollistrant is likely to be looking for a showier magic in return for a sphere. Elminster also revealed that his fellow chosen Salune, back when she dwelt in Shadowdale, had such a sphere and would leave it hovering to hang damp garments to dry over it and betimes drape a cowled robe over it and move it about to seem to be her to mislead would-be thieves and zent assassins. So, there you have it, the mystery of those silently hovering balls revealed. And as is the way of realm's lore, dozens of new questions raised some of which we might actually answer someday. Hi, welcome back to Realm Speak, and this time around, we're doing this. Hyracosphinx. Yeah, I know it doesn't look like that, but that is actually how it's pronounced, and this is from real-world mythology, far older than D&D, so... Hyracosmith. Hyracosphinx. Oh, I just stuffed the first two ways of saying that. It's not Smith, it's Sphinx. Yes, Hyracosphinx. And on the road, I met a Hyracosphinx. And that has made all the difference. That's why I'm missing from the waist down. 